All right, guys, this is John with Liquid Life Gardens. Um, I got a pretty big project I'm fixing to start. So I kind of wanted to give y'all an introduction to what I'm fixing to be doing. And then uh, also talk about this next couple of videos I'm going to do. Uh, I've been looking into geothermal for heating my water, my aquaponic system, and cooling it in the summertime. That ground here stays pretty wet pretty year-round. So... Um, you know, one of the things that uh, help with geothermal is uh, the moisture levels in the ground. And uh, so I started looking into it, didn't know much about it, still don't know much about it. But started looking into it to get me a more constant temperature. It, it's, it's easy to heat water and to cool water if it has a more steady temperature. Uh, all you got to do is just make up the difference. Uh, even if the te temperature is 60 degrees and you want 72. Um, you just gotta make up that difference. But when you're having temperature swings, it, it's a little harder to maintain. You use a lot more energy to both heat and cool. So I was looking into it, trying to figure a way to stabilize my temperature and then work from there up with heaters uh, in the wintertime. And in the summertime, I get pretty good thermal cooling um, with just the, the aquaponic system up in the greenhouse when the fans are running. So I've been looking into this and, um, you know, I looked into different stuff to do it and the cost of it and that. And, and I ain't running no, um, no kind of compression system or compressors and freons and that. Just using the good old earth to kind of just, you know, cool the water uh, and heat the water. And so I went in uh, and started looking at different stuff and I got a hold of this tubing right here. And it's, it's a half inch polytubing. 100 foot row and I found uh, at Lowe's uh, in a town not far from me uh, 600 feet of this for roughly $13 a, a, a row so at that price I really couldn't pass it up and now that I got the, the backhoe and uh, you know the tractor and that I can dig and so right here what I'm planning on doing is digging me a pit that's going to be 20 foot my greenhouse is 20 foot wide so it's going to be 20 foot 10 foot out and I'm going to have to go eight feet deep. And the reason I'm going to go eight feet deep is because I'm going I'm to stage it in two stages. So what I plan on doing is digging down four foot since my back hole only digs six feet max. I think it's 72, 70, might be 70 inches, but 72 inches. Uh, I'm going to dig four foot, the whole thing out at four foot. And then I'm going to slope it in, dig it, slope it in here, and then drive down in it and then dig the other four foot as I work my way the tractor back out. And what I wanted to do was I was going to lay one layer in that eight foot level, then bury it up about three, three to four foot of uh, soil, and then lay another layer of tubing, and then bury it all the way back up, and then run it through right here, punching it under the ground, keeping it insulated in, into the greenhouse, and then hooking it in there, and just pump the water through the ground, through all them little coils, and, that, <coughs> and then back in to the system and giving it a more steady i believe it's going to give it a more steady uh temperature uh, you know i'm that's why i say i'm not looking to to just just push the water in pick up the in the winter time the heat from the earth and uh you know and then pull it back into the system and then in the summertime pump the water through cooling it in that ground and then pulling it back putting it back into the system and see what that gets me uh you know for the value um that is going to be you know even if it saves me 15 20 dollars a month on electric in the winter time uh that will be tremendous and uh you know it's more comfortable for my fish if the temperature swings are not as drastic you know so a more steady temperature will always do better and then if i can get it to where it'll stay at least at 55 60 degrees steady even without the heaters uh that do my fish a lot better my koi uh, they, once you get into the 50 range you're really asking for some issues uh with koi and so you really need to let they start going into a hibernation mode they start producing hormones that trying to that that you know that they want to go into hibernation mode with and you really don't even want to get them there because if you do then you need to go ahead and let them go through a, at least a six week cycle of hibernation uh, because you can't feed them in that because uh, you know, they just can't digest food and it will actually kill them So <laughs> In the meantime, what also I wanted to do while I'm doing this project is I want to talk a lot about how 
the, some of the tricks I learned from the old timers and that, that I worked with on the construction sites and that, that taught me how to use heavy equipment and, and taught me how to use backhoes and some of the rules of thumbs they taught me, you know, and, um, you know, and use that information and, you know, put it out there for anybody who's wanting to learn a bit more about using backhoes and front end loaders and that and why I use them the way I do. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily the correct method. Uh, I imagine there's people out there that's far more professional than I'll ever be at it because it's not what I do for a living. It's never been what I did for a living. Uh, it was something I had interest in. And when I was on construction sites and that, I would talk with the operators and I'd watch them and I'd ask questions and ask them, why do you do it this way? And why do you do it that way? And that, to learn. Uh, so, you know, so whenever I needed to do something, uh, I had that knowledge with me. So, you know, so I'm going to give you all some of the stuff I've learned and picked up over the years on the construction sites and why they do some of the things they do. And uh, some of the things I've learned to make it very easy to understand how a backhoe works. And especially for when you're doing grade, it's one thing if you're just digging a hole. It's another thing if you, you need a certain grade. Uh, you need your ground to be perfectly or as close to perfectly level as possible for a long distance. Or you're digging at an angle, a slope and you want it to drain like a drainage ditch and that and um you know so working that backhoe in order to keep that grade constantly falling at the right mount the whole distance of the ditch you're digging uh so you know i'll give a couple of them tips that i've learned over the years with these guys and uh, if it helps somebody then great and if uh, you know if you know better uh, you know then don't, don't don't listen to what i gotta say stick with what you know so, but anyway, uh, this is going to be done in a couple of videos. Um, you know, it's Christmas weekend, and I actually got the weekend off the next three days, uh, today, Sunday, and Monday. So, I think I can do it in three days' time. I'm hoping so, because the rains are coming back again Wednesday. And so, and I don't want this thing filling up with water. So, uh, I'm going to give it a shot about digging this thing and getting it done, and back all backfilled and laid, the pipe all laid and all backfilled in, in three days. Uh, so hopefully I can make this happen So but uh, you know, I'm gonna shoot this in a couple of different video sets and uh, you know And then post them up and we'll go from there All right, so one of the one things I want to talk about is um, Is some you know some stuff that uh, you know a lot of people different people do different ways Okay, uh, one of the things that I hear a lot about is about when you're working a backhoe about keeping the wheels on the ground Okay uh, this is true in the sense that it, it does make the tractor far more stable. And if you don't want to move, if you lock it in the four-wheel drive and you lock your emergency brake down, you're locking all four tires as well. So then the tractor don't tend to move near as much uh, because it's got the resistance of the tires all locked in as well as your front bucket and your outriggers. Now, in a lot of the commercial equipment that I've worked with, uh, even if it had tires, uh, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't lock them down. Uh, you know, you wouldn't lock the emergency braking out because you use the backhoe to maneuver your piece of equipment. Uh, it was just not feasible to spin all the way around and move it back and forth uh, using the controls. You'd use your backhoe. Uh, you would pick it up, pick up the rear end of that, pick up your front end loader, and just push it back on the front tires and then uh, or pull it forward or swing it side to side and, and just kind of maneuver it using the backhoe positioning the whole thing i can literally walk this tractor completely around a stomp without never coming off that backhoe and that, that's one of the tricks to using the backhoe in a bigger uh commercial sense now on these little bit of tractors uh i don't know I, i've read through the books uh particularly on this one and i didn't see nothing that says don't do this and don't do that other than safety feature stuff. Uh, there was nothing on there about not lifting up the tractor using the backhoe to maneuver it. Um, so for me, I tend, to, uh, I tend to leave it in neutral and I will leave the tires on the ground best I can uh, and, and then leave it in neutral and use my, my outriggers and my bucket as my stops. And that way, if I need to push it back a little bit from the hole I'm working with, or pull forward some more, get closer in, all I gotta do is lift up my outriggers, lift up my bucket, and then take that backhoe, dig in and pull it forward, or dig in and push it and push it backwards. And so, uh, you know, so I leave my tractor in neutral all the time. But this is, this is, this is uh, uh, for most part, opinion. Uh, you know, it, it is not nothing written in concrete. 
So, you know, so, you know, kind of take it as it is. Uh, it is much safer if you if you lock them down. It is much safer if, if you got all the wheels on the ground. A lot of people scream it's it's set up that's supposed to be a three point triangle shape bucket outriggers, and that's the only thing that's supposed to be on the ground. But every time um, you lift that tractor up, for every inch you lift that tractor off the ground, you lose an inch of depth you're digging. So you know if you can keep the tires to the ground or low to the ground, you gain more depth on your backhoe. So that's one of the things. Uh, one of the other things that I learned, one of the first things, one of the old timers that I approached years ago uh, about digging uh, on a, uh, he was on a big old piece of equipment, big old um, track hoe. And I was asking him, how does he know his grades and that? Because he wasn't using lasers. He wasn't using none of that stuff. Uh, and this guy was digging and, and I mean, just laying it down. And he'd been doing it for 50 years. And he said one of the best things to do when you look at a backhoe is look at it from this point of view. Look at your boom, look at your stick, and look at your bucket. And imagine that your arm, okay? The upper part of your arm is your boom, the, between the elbow and the wrist is your stick, and your hand is your bucket. Now when you look at it from that point of view, you'll realize that if you don't move your boom and you just swing, backhoe has a natural arch to it pendulum swing right here so if you don't lower this when you go out you'll dig high come in deep and then come back up shallow so you maneuver your boom and your stick according to how deep you want to keep it so when you reach out you have to lower in and dig and as you're coming in you have to raise up then once you reach your center point you have to start lowering again to keep the digging now your bucket, same thing as your hand. If you imagine you were scraping, you were digging something with your hand, all right, and you got it flat and you're pulling along like this. Well, the closer you get, if you don't tilt your wrist, you start digging more and more in. So in order to keep it flat, keep them digging the same, you'd have to adjust your stick between your wrist and your elbow to hold it like that so that it keeps digging that same flat surface all the way as you pull closer and closer to you. And when you reach out, you also have to adjust your stick. My shirt's in the sleeves in the way. You have to adjust your stick right there to keep that flat of that bucket digging at the same. Or you, you'll be like this and you'll be raking like this instead of actually digging. Now, you, there's digging and then there's digging with a grade. If you're just reaching in and grabbing and digging up, that's one thing. But if you want to dig with a grade, you want to go in, dig, tilt your bucket where the flat is at the level you want to try to achieve or close to it. Because I don't never recommend trying one shot deal. Uh, you know, you work your way down a couple of inches you know, or a foot at a time to get your grade. You dig down and you curl that bucket and then you start rolling that bucket along like this, along that ground at that depth you're looking for. And then you pull it up. In order to keep that bucket maneuvering from here to there at that same flat, you're going to have to adjust both the boom and you're going to have to adjust your stick at the same time as it's moving. That's why dual function in a backhoe is so critical that you can do two things at one time, boom up and pull in or stick in and curl at the same time because it allows you to maintain that control over your grade, not so much over the, the backhoe itself. The backhoe is doing a job, but the ultimate finish of the job is, is your grade in the ground. That's what you're looking for. That's your goal. That's what you're trying to achieve. So in order to do that, you have to have double functions at the minimum, uh, you know, between either the bucket and the stick or the stick and the boom or the boom and the stick uh, bucket. So you got to be able to have that double function. And there are probably going to be some people that's going to disagree with this. And, you know, but, you know, what it is, it is. Uh, yeah, I, I do what I do. I, I, and it's worked for me. And I've seen these guys, uh, you know, in Louisiana, it's really hard to dig around here. Uh, we don't have, um, we have mud. We have mud. We have wet, wet, wet soil. We have clay. Um, if you dig a three-foot hole and give it a few days and come back, that's going to be full of water without raindrop. So it's really hard to dig here because you'll hit different soil types fairly quickly before you even get too deep. 
And so you really got to know how to keep that grade going through them different soils because at one point your machine is, is really working hard through some clay and all of a sudden it breaks through into some soft soil and you'll dig, you'll, you'll jump down freaking six inches like that in a heartbeat. So you really got to watch what you're doing and pay attention to your grade as you're digging. So I hope to show some of that here. Now it did rain uh, when this cool front came through. It rained last night. It rained two days ago. Uh, so the ground is fairly wet. And I'm pretty sure, I'm almost positive, that as I start digging, I'm gonna, you'll see water start to appear in this hole. And uh, it is, even if it was dry and hadn't rained for two or three weeks, you'll probably see water appear in this hole. And so this is one of the parts that's gonna be a little challenging is to make sure that I can get my tractor down into this thing and get it back out without getting it stuck or sinking it, you know, plumb to the frame and, and just solid mud. So I'm hoping usually uh, on my property here, some of the places we've already dug before, once you get about two and a half, three foot down, you hit pretty solid clay. And then, you know, and it's pretty, pretty thick. Uh, you know, we've dug a couple of eight, nine foot holes, uh, set in septic system, septic tanks and that. And it was, um, it was pretty solid clay, but the water came in so fast, even when I did my, or when they did my septic system, uh, the mechanical system, the water was coming in so fast uh, they had to fill the tank up with water to sink it because the water in the hole was filling faster than they could dig. Uh, and it hadn't rained for, at that point, for several weeks. So I'm going to kind of play it by ear and see what happens. Uh, and hopefully it goes well. But, uh, you know, this is coming to kind of some of the points I wanted to hit on. If you imagine that, that sucker like your arm you can get a better understanding of why you have to function it the way you do. And when you're digging it, if you just think about it for a second, when you're looking at the thing and think about your arm doing that same digging and trying to achieve that same goal, you'll get an idea of why you must boom up and, and, and stick in that. And you'll tweak your controls better set for what your, your, you know, the job is calling for. So, and that was one of the tricks, the old, one of the old times told me, he said, before you can even start to worry about what functions, do, what controls do what, he said, you got to understand the principle of how this thing works. And he said, and the best way to picture it in your mind is just imagine it's your arm. And, and, and when he said that, and I started looking at it, and he explained that to me, it made quite a bit of sense uh, to me. And it was, it was easy for me to understand why you know you're booming up and and digging in at the same time and all this to maintain that certain grade so but anyway uh let me fire the tractor up it still needs a little bit more warming and uh we're gonna start digging as you can see i got it marked out and um so we're gonna start digging and uh let's see how far i can get on this <laughs> 